Good evening, everyone. My name is Jane Ricketts. I'm a librarian at the Hunterdon County Library, and I'm very pleased to welcome all of you here this evening for this special presentation by our guest speaker, Dr. Carl Linskoog, Assistant Professor at Raritan Valley Community College. He teaches history. He is the author of Detain and Punish, Haitian Refugees and the Rise of the World's Largest Immigration Detention System. Tonight, Dr. Linskoog is going to be talking to us about his, experiences, uh, his experiences from his recent visit to the Whitney Plantation in Louisiana. And this is in commemoration of Black History Month, which is concluding today. Welcome and thank you to Dr. Linsku. Thank you very much, Jane. And, and thanks to the Hunterdon County Library for hosting this. This is the third event I've done with the Hunterdon County Library, um, one of which was closely related to this talk. We, um, our first event together, we had a community read of 12 Years a Slave by Solomon Northup. And you might know that story. Um, he was a free person captured and um, sold into slavery. Uh, and he spent most of his time um, on the, the banks of the Mississippi River in the sugar country. Um, so this, this uh, history of the Whitney Plantation is quite relevant to that event that we already had. So I'm glad to be back here. Someday I hope that we can um, be doing this in person, but this is good. Uh, let me just make a few notes about um, uh, sort of tech stuff. One, first, I think if, um, if you don't have it already set to speaker view, that might be the best. There's a little um, option up in the top right hand corner that says view. If you click on that and click speaker, um, that will allow you to see my presentation more easily. And, um, and I think that would be best, especially with so many participants. Second thing uh, I'm going to ask, and it seems like everyone's already there, is that everyone please just mute, mute themselves, mute yourself until it's time to make a comment or ask a question. Um, and then the third thing is we're, um, we're going to have some discussion kind of interspersed throughout the presentation. Jane and I talked about me doing a whole presentation and then having time enough at the end. And that I think that would have been fine. But I also think there's some things that you might want to comment on or react to or ask questions about as we go along. And so um, periodically I'm gonna pause and say, you know, what thoughts do you have, what questions, what comments? And when you do that, I think the best, especially because there's, you know, nearly 30 of us here, the best um, way to, do, to participate is by going to the bottom of your screen, screen click, clicking on reactions. And there, once you do that, you can see raise hand and once you click on raise hand, then I'll be able to keep track of who's in the queue to make a comment and I'll call on people and that can kind of keep things um, more or less orderly. Um, so that's my, that's my advice for how to handle some of these technical issues. Um, and I think that we should begin then. So um, I do have a presentation. I'm gonna be sharing my screen with you shortly, but I first just wanna say good evening to everyone and thanks for joining us for this lecture and discussion about the history of slavery and freedom in Wallace, Louisiana. Uh, and through the particular lens of one site, a special uh, site called Whitney Plantation, uh, located on the west bank of the Mississippi River, um, just about an hour west of New Orleans. So before I jump in, right? All right. So before we get into the formal part of the presentation, uh, I just want to say that um, I've taught United States and African American history for more than 15 years and had many discussions about slavery and freedom um, based on a lot of reading I did in graduate school and beyond. Um, but until last month when I um, visited the Whitney Plantation, I've never physically been in a place like this where enslaved people lived and labored. Um, and I have to say it was really just a revelation. I wasn't prepared at all for how I um, would experience this. And I really wanted to share this. And so um, we had, Jane and I had already discussed this doing a Black History Month presentation. And this is what we selected for it. 
Um, as, I'll, as I'll talk about, visiting Whitney Plantation allowed me to learn about the history of slavery and freedom in a way that no amount of reading uh, and study in these excellent books and articles could have. It really sort of brought it to another level. Um, and I wanna share that experience with you. Um, so thanks again to Jane and for, to Underden County Library for this. Um, now I'm gonna share, see if I can share my screen so I can give you my presentation here. All right, Jane, can you confirm that you're seeing the presentation? Okay, good. So tonight I'm gonna to share with you some of the insights and images from my experiencing visiting Whitney Plantation. And we'll be sure to leave plenty of time throughout. And I, I believe at the end for you to make comments, uh, ask questions, have discussion. Um, okay. So Whitney Plantation is a pretty unique place. I'm not sure if people have heard of it or maybe some of you even visited it. Uh, I didn't know about it until um, recently. And so when I was down in New Orleans, I made it a priority to visit it. It was established in 1752 by a German immigrant to French Louisiana named Ambrose Heidel. Uh, and so therefore the plantation was first known as Habitation Heidel and later Whitney Plantation after it was sold to another owner. Whitney Plantation was a place of enslavement throughout the Civil War and the abolition of slavery in the United States and it continued to be a working pop plantation until it closed in 1975. Um, which is really interesting because um, that means that a lot of the sort of uh, dynamics about who had power, who was doing the work, who was in control continued well after near, uh, more than 100 years after the formal abolition of slavery because it was um, many of the descendants and family members of those who were enslaved that continued to live on the plantation and continued to sh harvest sugarcane there. Um, you can actually visit many historically preserved plantations in Southern Louisiana, but Whitney Plantation is different. The writer and poet Clint Smith, who was born and raised in New Orleans, explains it this way. Whitney Plantation is unlike almost any other plantation in the country. In a state where plantations remain the sites of formal celebrations and weddings, where Tours of former slave estates nostalgically center on the architectural merits of the old homes, where you're still more likely to hear stories about how the owners of the land treated their slaves well than you are to hear the experiences of actual enslaved people. The Whitney stands apart by making the story of the enslaved the core of the experience. Whitney is an open air museum on the history and legacy of slavery and a memorial to the enslaved. It opened to the public in 2014. What I want to do now is share a short video with you to help you learn a little bit more about the origins of the Whitney Plantation, how it came to be such a unique site of learning and memory. So let's see. Here, hold on a second. Just give me one second here. I have to skip this. Um, thought I had everything queued up. Just let me just try one more thing.
Quick question for you. What do bad breath and your poop have in common? And did you know that it's related to weight loss? Over the last 16 years, we have been working on the Whitney Plantation. This plantation was built in 1790. The plantation was settled by Ambrose Heidel, and this property was available for sale. And for the first year, I just wrapped everything in plastic because it was only a real estate investment for me. But it was very shocking to me that I did not know about slavery. And I knew new slaves were here, of course. I had no idea what a commodity they were and how they were treated as a commodity. I had no idea of how, how deprived they were not by force of circumstance, but by deliberate planning. Like the sheriff of the parish, or the head of the militia would have something like this, to lock up runaway slaves until uh, the master comes and uh, claim them and pay the fees for feeding and watering, you know. They always refer to those slaves as animals. And even the runaway slaves, you know, they use the name Maroon. Maroon is from Cimarron, and Cimarron, or Cimarrones, are wild pig, you know. And this was part of uh, slave control. Uh, my name is uh, Ibrahim Asek. I met John Cummings in 2000, and uh, he decided to hire me to be the director of research of this project. The fact of going into the archives and digging all those names and taking them back to life, everybody who comes here would know that uh, Abdu from Senegal was a slave here. He died in 1836. You don't just teach slavery. These people have backgrounds. They came from Africa. But also you have to know that these people came maybe naked or half naked but they didn't need a suitcase to put the culture inside. When you say blues, jazz, rock and roll, Zaidiko, they know it all over the country and they like it. You know? It is rooted into slavery. People need to understand what happened on these plantations. It is not just a way of putting the guilt of, on someone. No, we don't need that. We need to understand today why we have so many problems in America, why so many people are in jail? Why so much poverty? Black people being shot and killed like game. All that was rooted in slavery. And if you don't understand the source of the problem, how can we solve it? What people have to realize, it was a bunch of people like me who started this mess. And they started slavery. And they dealt in slaves. And so why would it be a, a surprise if some white kid came along as a cheerleader and was trying to do something that would correct what his ancestors did. So I thought that I personally would no longer be satisfied living in ignorance. And also that I would try my best to present the facts of slavery to all of the people I could find so that Everyone would understand how strong the deck was stacked against the Africans here. I spent 16 years so far, and we're north of $8 million now. We're not finished. I'm down a plotty old gray man that I plotty could when I make my 50 cents, Lord, I carry it home to Rose. Come on, here, old mule. Woo! Okay, um, I'm going to share my presentation again now. I'll try to. So um, that introduced you to the creators of the Whitney Plantation and some of what was motivating it, um, those who got, were involved in this to make this such a unique place 
of learning and memory. Um, before I start to tell some of these stories and get in, I just want to share um, a few of my sources I used for this uh, presentation. Um, this book here, Buki Fate Gombo, is by the person we met, Ibrahima uh, Sek, and he's one of the historians who's, who's worked on the plantation and documented that history. I'm also already referred to How the Word is Passed. You may know that book by Clint Smith. He's got a chapter on the Whitney Plantation, and I would definitely recommend the whole book. Um, I used the extensive history that's featured on the Whitney Plantation website um, for some of this talk. So you could go there too and read that. And then the expanded book uh, length version of the 1619 Project, The New Origin Story by Nicole Hannah Jones and the um, New York Times Magazine staff also informed this, especially at a uh, chapter on sugar by Khalil Gibran Muhammad. So I learned um, through visiting the Whitney Plantation about um, some of the people who came, were brought here. Philippe, whose name we see there is one of them. He was born around 1799, as it says there in the Temne nation of Western Africa, which is today Sierra Leone. We don't know precisely when Philippe was brought to the plantation, but we do know that he was one of 12 and a half million enslaved Africans who were brought to the Americas through the transatlantic slave trade. According to historian Ibrahim Asek, Philippe and other slaves imported in Louisiana were mostly shipped from three major regions in the coast of Africa, Senegambia, the Bights of Benin and Biafra, and Central Africa. Philippe is one of many memorialized on this wall of honor you can see here. And if you visit Whitney Plantation and take, you go according to the tour, this is your first stop. Here you learn the names, the birth dates, and the birthplaces, if they can know them, of all of the African and US born people who were enslaved at Whitney Plantation. More than 350 people were located here. Uh, were located in the official records and they're all honored here. And just this place um, as a starting place to spend time looking at the names, looking at the birth dates, looking at the places of origin, birthplaces is really remarkable and a very powerful way to, um, to, to begin this experience. The first ships carrying enslaved Africans arrived in Louisiana in 1719. In the early 18th century, Louisiana's plantation owners enslaved Africans as well as Native, Native Americans, and they relied on the labor of white indentured servants. But by 1795, the number of enslaved Africans in Louisiana had grown to 19,926. Nearly 3,000 of those people lived on what is called what was called the German coast of the Mississippi River, where Whitney Plantation is located. So what was life like for Philippe and the other Africans and African-Americans who ended up at Whitney Plantation? The organization's website gives us an important overview. Enslaved people led a grueling life centered on labor. They worked from sunup to sundown to make life easy and enjoyable for their, their enslavers. Enslaved women who served as wet nurses had to care for their owner's children instead of their own. Enslaved people kept a tenuous grasp on their families, frequently experiencing the loss of sale. But there are ways that walking the same paths and roads that the enslaved walked and occupying the same spaces as they did communicates much more. After you learn the names, birth dates, and birthplaces of those who were enslaved on Whitney Plantation, you walk toward the main residence of the plantation owners, the big house. Along the way, you encounter art that reminds you that this was a site not just of enslavement, but also of emancipation. If you're walking along a path which leads around the big house, your guide encourages you to continue walking the path away from the house. 
And as you turn the corner, you see a child standing at the end of the path. Although I had read that sculptures of children were featured among the plantation grounds, it still took me by surprise. So lifelike, it was really an arresting experience to see it standing there, to see him standing there. The sculptures of children around the plantation are known as, known as the Children of Whitney, the creation of artist Woodrow Nash. To tell the story of enslaved people on Whitney Plantation, the curators rely on interviews with the last generation of people who experienced slavery, collected in the 1930s by the Federal Writers Project. These interviewees, formerly enslaved people who shared their stories, were mostly children when they were enslaved. And so the children of Whitney represents these former slaves as they were at the time of emancipation, children. As the Whitney's website explains, through their stories, visitors are introduced to the lives of the enslaved workers based on the recollections of those who endured and who shared the stories of their lives as children in slavery. It was also a powerful experience once at the end of the path where that child stood to then turn around and look at the house and the pathway leading up to it under a canopy of beautiful old trees. The same trees that had cast a sh their shadows on the enslaved people who lived there. For me, it's hard to describe what it felt like to be in this space with the weight of so much history and so much suffering. I'm gonna see if I can play another video that I took and see if I'm successful. Sorry, are you able to see it right now? Sorry, something went wrong there. Um, I'm just going to go back to my presentation. Once you get to the main residence, you're able to observe the main living area of the plantation owner and family. This is the so-called big house from the front. Here's some of the interior shots, the main living area, some of the side rooms which are used for dining. But the food and service that came into this space was provided from without. Out behind the big house, as you can see in these two pictures here, there's a large yard where much of the domestic, that is non-agricultural labor, would have occurred. This would have been a busy place um, in terms of taking care of the washing, the butchering, um, food preparation, because also sitting right here on the edge of the yard is the kitchen. In 1819, the plantation cooks were named Marie 
Joseph, who was 50 years old, and Marie, who was 43 years old. According to the Whitney website, as Creoles born in Louisiana, Marie, Joseph, and Marie would have used European recipes along with Creole recipes such as gumbo, jambalaya, crawfish, etouffee, and smothered okra, which they concocted from European, African, and Native American foodways. By 1860, records show that women named Julianne and Marie were the plantation cooks. Lucy and Francois were the laundry workers. And Sally worked inside the big house. Together, they had 13 children who would have no doubt been found playing in this yard when they weren't attending to the needs of the master's family. Further back behind the yard in the kitchen, you can find the slave quarters. The Whitney Plantation counted 22 slave cabins on its site, housing for the field hands and located along the road down river from the big house. This is some images of the slave cabins and their interiors. They were still actually in very good shape in the late 1970s, and many of the same families of the formerly enslaved people continued to occupy them and work on the plantation, but then they were torn down in order to allow for large vehicles access to the river to transport harvested sugarcane. These cabins were taken from, the ones we see here in the interiors we see here, were taken from other neighboring plantations, but would have been very similar to those original cabins that housed the enslaved on Whitney Plantation. You can see here on the right side, the children of Whitney in and around these living spaces, which I found to be a very powerful and haunting part of this experience. Because I talk with my students, some of whom might be here, about how to think about humanity in the midst of slavery, such an utterly inhumane and dehumanizing institution. We talk about how the scholar Orlando Patterson theorized that the essence of slavery is what he called social death, because it requires denial of the humanity of the enslaved. And yet, my students and I consider enslaved humans remained human and continue to assert their humanity. The children in and around these living spaces are a reminder about the persistent, determined humanity of the enslaved even in the face of unimaginable inhumanity. So I wanna pause and see if we wanna just um, have a little conversation now. I have more to share, of course, um, but I wanna know if any um, images, anything I said, anything you learned, anything else you're bringing already into this conversation resonated, or if you wanna um, ask any questions and we can have a little conversation and then we'll move on. And I would also remind you that if you would like to make a comment, if you wanna just click on reactions there at the bottom, click raise hand and I'll see your hand pop up and I will invite you to unmute and then we can have a conversation that way. So what do you think so far? What's interesting? What questions do you have? Were there any images that really um, caught your mind? Okay, I see um, Anita, I see Jasmine after that, and Carolyn has a clapping symbol. I'm not sure if she's trying That's to raise it. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, let's hear, let's go with Anita since Anita was the first to, um, to raise her virtual hand. Thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, it's interesting because I, I, I just learned about the Whitney Plantation and I, and I read um, uh, one of the books that you mentioned also. Um, I was actually, this is kind of maybe a silly question, but I was actually curious about seeing the floor of the big house. And it didn't strike me as seeing some, knowing some of the other um, wealthy people around, but then it was a, a brick or stone floor. And I was just curious about how wealthy the Whitney's or, or other people that, I guess the original Germans that owned this plantation, why the floor was, you know, what the house doesn't seem as wealthy as it, I would have expected, I guess. 
Yeah, well, that's I think that's interesting. And and I, too, was um, sort of surprised at how we could only when I was there, at least we could only visit the ground floor and there was an external staircase that allowed you to go up to upstairs and what I assume were the sleeping quarters and the bedrooms and things. It was a pretty limited space on the bottom. Um, there was only one sort of main room and then maybe a couple rooms adjacent. I think um, if that's the original structure, and I think it was, it may be because uh, it was constructed in 1750, the 1750s. I'm not sure if that was um, the same house, but if that, that um, may be the reason why it wasn't as extravagant as some of those um, plantations that we see and that would have been adjacent and neighboring to. Um, but I don't know just if anyone else has um, any other insights about that, you know, definitely want you to jump in, just raise your hand. Thanks for that insight, Anita. Um, Jasmine. Hi. Um, so I did, I did notice that too, like Anita. Um, I was like, why is the floors like that? Um, but now thinking back, that might have been upscale for them, you know, at that time frame. Um, but for me, I was just like, I found it very interesting how they took like um, previous slaves and incorporated it in, into the plantation. Um, it kind of reminded me of the Wax Museum in um, Baltimore, I believe, um, where you see these figures and stuff of, you know, slaves or whatever, like on a ship. And so I thought that was really interesting with the children um, and a little eerie at the same time, you know, because this is something that actually happened in time. So, yeah, that was my only yeah. feedback. It was a little, a little taken away by it at first. Yeah, I had the same experience. Um, it is eerie. It's, you know, as, as I'll talk about, as you progress throughout the plantation grounds and start to get to the memorials, especially, it's, it's like a weight on you and the really um, thoughtfully curated art and sculptures and memorials, um, which, you know, um, it, it starts to pile up and it's a very, very powerful experience. Um, yes. Carolyn, did you, um, did you want to make a comment, Carolyn? Yes, I did. Um, thank you. I didn't mean to clap, but I didn't see a raised hand. Okay. <laughs> it was the only hand I saw. That's so um, having visited Monticello in December, and that was the first time I ever visited or set foot on um, a plantation, and comparing it to this experience, um, I, I of course did notice the floor, but overall what I see is that, and again, this is only my second plantation, um, is that the plantations that were part of president, presidential history are, the houses are much more fanciful um, and the interior, the interiors, which they take you on a tour of, um, all of the interior is, is very fanciful. Whereas this looks to be much more basic uh, materials. And the only thing I can offer is as a, comment to the flooring is that Louisiana was very swampy and maybe the floors held up better than wood would have in a very damp environment. But who yeah, knows? Yeah, interesting. Thanks for that. And I'll just, um, and we'll, we'll take two, there's two more hands up, we'll take two more comments and then we're gonna move along with the presentation. But before we do, I just wanna say to Carolyn and to everyone, especially because you mentioned, Monte, mentioned Monticello. So this book, which I already mentioned by yes. Clint Smith, um, he, he, um, he, his first chapter is about Monticello and then he contrasts Whitney Plantation and the experience there with what it was like to go to Thomas Jefferson's estate. So. And from there, he moves on to the Angola Penitentiary in Louisiana. Yeah. So it's it's an interesting exploration of memory and um, ongoing memorialization. So okay, I see. If I might, hands. if I might just add sure. that that book was the uh, inspiration okay. to take the plantation trip. 
Oh, great. Well, maybe you'll go to um, Whitney next. Then. Yes. Um, that's great. And OK, <laughs> so you. we've got Rhonda and then John, and then we're going to move on from there. Go ahead, Rhonda. Thank you, Carl. I was just kind of curious. Um, you mentioned and we saw the images of the children throughout the plantation, the, the statues. So it's like a two part question. One, why just the children? I'm, I might have missed that because I was working on working out on my bike while I was listening to you and watching. Good trying for you. To do double, <laughs> double duty. And were there any other figures or statues amongst around the plantation? Were there adults um, or women or men? Why was uh, why was the emphasis just on the children? I'm kind of curious about that. Yeah. So um, there are other statues but nothing that's supposed to be realistic, like, like you, know, you know, human beings just placed at different places. They're all children. And according to what I've learned, the artist chose that because uh, we don't really have any personal testimonies of people who actually lived and labored and died on the Whitney Plantation. But what we have is the, is the stories recorded um, by that last living generation of enslaved people in the 1930s. And because it was the 1930s, you know, they would have had to have been children uh, to have survived that long. And so the, the artist um, wanted to portray them as they would have, these people would have been uh, when they lived on that space. And you'll see some of the other um, statues that were adults, but they're very different as you'll see different kinds of statues. Um, thanks for that question, Rhonda. John. We're not hearing you yet, John. Can't can't hear you. Um, I'm not sure what might be going on with your audio. Um, you might sometimes, uh, in my experience, if you log off and log back in. Um, we can try to catch you on the next um, on the next round of questions and comments. Can you hear me now? Oh, we can hear you now. Yes, we can. Okay. Um, my comment was the same as Caroline's. That floor struck me as something you would see in a flood zone okay. or in a swampy place, you know, um, that was, you know, just wet where you couldn't put wood. And mm -hmm. a lot of Louisiana, I think, is like that. Yeah. And right on the on the bank of the Mississippi River. So um, yeah, thanks for that. Thanks, John. All right, so let's, thanks for that. I hope there are other people will join the conversation in the next round of discussion, but we're gonna move along here. Okay, so what kind of labor did the people do who lived in these cabins? Well, in the early years of the Whitney plantation, um, the main product was indigo, which is a blue dye used to, in textile production. And enslaved women usually grew and maintained the indigo crop, and while enslaved men typically worked to produce the dye from the plants. But at the turn of the 19th century, sugar replaced indigo as the plantation's most profitable product. Enslavement on a sugar plantation made life especially difficult and deadly. The Whitney Plantation website details the production process. Sugarcane was planted in January and February and harvested from mid-October to December. After the planting season, enslaved workers began work in other areas on the plantation, such as cultivating corn and other food crops, harvesting wood from the surrounding forests, and maintaining levees and canals. The harvest season for sugarcane was called the grinding season. It began in October. Field hands cut the cane and loaded it into carts, which were driven to the sugar mill. At the mill, enslaved workers fed the cane stalks into steam-powered grinders in order to extract the sugar juice inside the stalks. The juice was then boiled down in a series of open kettles called the Jamaica train. You can see some of these large sugar kettles, uh, sugar cane kettles here on the right. This, the juice was then boiled down in a series of kettles. In the last stage, the sugar crystallized. Sugar pr plantations produced raw sugar as well as molasses, which were packed into wooden barrels and the plantation and then shipped out to market in New Orleans. 
On Whitney Plantation in 1860, we know that a 50-year-old man named Grand Lewis and a 45-year-old person named Tom were the head sugar makers, and they were assisted by a 35-year-old man named Green. These three men, who found themselves on a Louisiana sugar plantation on the eve of the Civil War, had been transferred from the Upper South in what historians call the domestic slave trade, probably torn from parents, wives, and children. This was such a terrible stage in history that it's sometimes called the Second Middle Passage. Because of the nature of sugar production, enslaved people suffered tremendously in Southern Louisiana. The sugar districts of Louisiana stand out as the only area in the slaveholding South where a negative birth rate among the enslaved population existed. Death was common on Louisiana's sugar plantations due to the harsh nature of the labor, the disease environment, and lack of proper nutrition and medical care. In a chapter on sugar for the 1619 Project Anthology, historian Khalil Gibran Muhammad adds this. To achieve the highest efficiency, sugar houses operated night and day. On cane plantations in sugar time, there is no distinction as to the days of the week. Solomon Northup, author of 12, year, 12 Years a Slave, wrote, fatigue might mean losing an arm to the grinding rollers or being flayed for failing to keep up. Enslavers often met resistance with sadistic cruelty. A formerly enslaved black woman named Mrs. Webb described a torture chamber used by her enslaver named Valson Marmillion. One of his cruelties was to place a disobedient slave standing in a box in which there were nails placed in such a manner that the poor creature was unable to move, she told a WPA interviewer in 1940. He was powerless even to chase the flies or sometimes ants crawling on parts of his body. The plantation was a site of extreme violence because of the nature of production, maximized production of a commodity like sugar for maximized profit. And because of the nature of slavery, depriving people of their liberty to exploit their labor and attempting to transform them from human into commodity, bodies that can be bought and sold for profit, just like the sugar their bodies produced. The sugar cane and the kettles themselves that we can see here in front of one of the slave cabins are testament to the violence on Whitney Plantation. The jail, which you can see here, sits out behind the kitchen and adjacent to the carriage house and blacksmith shop. This structure was not actually original to the plantation and was probably constructed after the Civil War sometime between 1870 and 1890. But many plantations had similar spaces of confinement which were used to hold the disobedient, the rebellious, or those being prepared for sale. This particular jail was probably used to hold black men and women arrested in the later, late 19th century and early 20th century and forced to labor then under what was called the convict leasing system, which replaced chattel slavery as a new mechanism to control the movement and exploit the labor of African-Americans. Now, just as slavery required enormous amounts of violence to control the enslaved, resistance was inevitable and constant in one form or another. Resistance started from the very moment of capture and continued long before the enslaved even arrived in the Americas. You can see here, I'm spotlighting um, something I don't know if I was aware of before visiting this, that an estimated 10% of slaving voyages experienced violent revolts and there was potential for many more, probably on every, every voyage, except for the brutality and the special methods to control the enslaved population on ship. I wanted to just give, make a note about another book I've been reading, which you might like to take a look at. Uh, it's called Wake, The Hidden History of Women-Led Slave Revolts, and it's a graphic novel um, that portrays some of this history that I didn't, definitely didn't know about regarding um, resistance by the enslaved. On Whitney Plantation, enslaved people resisted just as they did elsewhere, just as they did in New Jersey, as I've been discussing with my students, from everyday acts of resistance, such as working slowly, refusing to work, or feigning illness to avoid work, to liberating themselves by running away, to outright rebellion. 
according to materials provided by the Whitney, enslaved people running away into the swamps of Louisiana and became maroons, participating in maroonage, which was a permanent and very common act of resistance. But the most significant moment of rebellion and revolt on the German coast that included Whitney Plantation occurred in 1811. Charles de Lind, a mixed race Creole born enslaved person around 1780, who was an overseer working on a plantation neighboring Whitney Plantation led the insurrection. In what would come to be known as the 1811 German Coast Uprising, an estimated 500 people rose up in the largest slave revolt in the Southern United States. On their march to New Orleans, which the insurgents hoped to capture in order to free the enslaved there and to make their way to a free country, insurgents burned several plantation houses and added more enslaved people and Maroons to their number. Whitney plantation materials state that the rebels knew that if they were not successful, only death would be the end of their journey. The actions of these freedom fighters were in many ways the same as the actions of the founding fathers of the United States, these materials state, who had signed the Declaration of Independence only 35 years earlier. Both groups of revolutionaries knew that they would be killed if they lost their bid for freedom. They also almost certainly were knowledgeable, knowledgeable about and drew inspiration from the successful Haitian Revolution, an insurrection by enslaved pe people in French Saint-Domingue that led to the world's first Black Republic. Despite being well planned and coordinated, however, the insurgency could not match the firepower of the militia assembled to suppress the revolt. After three days of battle, the insurrection was broken, many were killed, and some were arrested and put on trial. After conviction, they were executed. What you can see here is a memorial to the martyrs of the 1811 German Coast Uprising. It's another very moving, arresting, haunting space um, that you visit just after coming from the slave quarters and slave cabins. And you see all these heads on these pikes um, as some were decapitated and their heads placed on pike to provide an object lesson to those that there should be no rebellion. Clint Smith writes that unlike other rebellions, such as Nat Turner's or John Brown's, the 1811 slave revolt has received little attention in the collective public memory. Learning about this revolt, of which I actually knew very little before visiting the Whitney Plantation, and experiencing this memorial was an amazingly powerful way that the Whitney Plantation gives crucial attention to the element of resistance in the history of slavery. These faces, writes Clint Smith, exemplify how the Whitney Plantation is unlike almost any other plantation in the country. For me, the Memorial of the Martyrs of the 1811 German Coast Uprising was simultaneously exhilarating, inspiring, but also completely devastating. At this point in the experience, the weight of this space and of the past was just tremendous. I can't really describe what it felt like. Um, I, and I couldn't imagine after this Memorial to the Martyrs of 1811 that there could be something that in the remaining portions of the Whitney Plantation that would be even more powerful, but there was. Exiting the Uprising Memorial, you encounter more art, which is all the more powerful because of what you've learned and encountered on the path up to this point. Here's two of those pieces. I'll let you take a look at for a moment. And then you get to the field of angels, which after the cumulative weight of everything you've experienced so far, for me was the absolute breaking point. The Field of Angels honors 2,200 enslaved children who died in St. John the Baptist Parish where Whitney Plantation is located between the years 1823 and 1863. As plantation materials explained, 
Disease and harsh labor created high death rates. Enslaved mothers suffered tremendously. Francois, an enslaved laundress who we met earlier, lost five children by age 23. Three died within one month. So take a look at some of these images in the way this memorial to lost enslaved children portrays them. These testimonies would have been among those taken from the Federal Writers Project interviews with formerly enslaved people. Here, I know it's a little hard to see, um, but you see the names, the ages, and the birth dates of all the children that they were able to document. And for me, parent of two young children, um, it was really difficult to just spend time reading the names, thinking about the ages, looking at the birthdays, it was a lot. <laughs> At the time, I think I'm just gonna finish the presentation and then we can have a full pledge discussion instead of stopping one more time before I'm finished. So exiting the field of angels, you come to the penultimate stop on the Whitney Plantation. And that's what's called Alais Gwendolyn Midlow Hall, a memorial dedicated to over 107,000 people enslaved in Louisiana between the years 1719, which was the year the first slave ships arrived in the colony, and 1820. So, of course, there's still uh, 45 more years of enslavement and formal slavery after that, but that's just between 1719 and 1820. The historian Gwendolyn Midlow Hall did what seemed impossible, documenting and recording the names of all these people in the database she created, which is called Afro-Louisiana History and Genealogy, 1719 to 1820. All of these people's names are record recorded here on these walls and in this memorial. We don't know where most of these people are buried. We don't know very much about them because slavery silences and erases. But thanks to the research and to this memorial, we can know their names, every one of which is recorded here. We can remember them and we can honor them. This was another extremely profound <laughs> space for me because I, sat there thinking about how there are 107,000 souls honored here, all victims of slavery, but thanks to the painstaking research and this memorial, they can still be remembered and honored. This was also one of the most profound moments of the whole Whitney experience for me. The Alais Gwendolyn Midlow Hall Memorial, along with everything that came before it, really the entire experience, helped me understand that there are such profound truths about the history of slavery that no academic study can ever fully reach. The final stop on the Whitney Plantation experience is Antioch Baptist Church. Like the jail that we saw before, this structure was built after the abolition of slavery in Paulina, Louisiana by freedmen. It was originally known as the anti-yoke Baptist congregation, anti-yoke meaning free oneself from the yoke of slavery and anti-yoke anti became Antioch. And this community and then this church structure was formed out of a mutual aid society and the community that formed it still exists and is now called the first community Antioch Baptist Church. In 1999, they generously donated this church to Whitney Plantation 
and it stands as a symbol of the activity of freed people in the wake of emancipation. In the interior, interior of the church, which you can see here on the right side, Whitney's children once again help us imagine the place of life, humanity, and the place children and young people may have occupied in this important space symbolizing perseverance and freedom. So I'm gonna close the formal presentation by reading one more passage from the end of Clint Smith's chapter on the Whitney Plantation. This again is from the book, How the Word is Passed. The Whitney exists as a laboratory for historical ambition, an experiment in rewriting what long ago was rewritten it is a hammer attempting to unbend four centuries of crooked nails. It's a place asking the question, how do you tell a story that's been told the wrong way for so long? For some, it's a place that doesn't fully live up to its ambition, a scattered assortment of exhibits that fails to tell a cohesive story. For others, it is a necessary, even if imperfect, corrective against the history that has been misrepresented or ignored for so long place that does far more good than harm. From both perspectives, it has served as a catalyst for discussion about how plantations should reveal the truth of slavery in ways that few other places have. I stepped off the creaking porch of the slave cabin and turned around, looking in the direction of the memorial to the 1811 slave revolt, which sits on the plantation's edge. I thought of how I had grown up in Louisiana and had never been taught that the largest slave rebellion in US history happened just miles from the city that had raised me. I had never been taught that the Louisiana Purchase was a direct result of the Haitian Revolution, the uprising that laid the groundwork for all the slave revolts that followed in its wake. About 50 yards from the slave cabins was a large bell its cylinder of cast iron widening at the lip as if trying to get a better look at the earth beneath it, its color dulled by years of exposure to the elements. A coiled rope, its pale brown fibers braided tightly together was tied to the top of the bell and hung down at its side. Historically, the role of the bell on a plantation served two purposes. It was used to signal when it was time to go out into the fields at the beginning of the day and when it was time to return at the end of it. It was also used to summon enslaved people. Often when someone was about to be punished, an audible marker of the terror that enslavers maintained. At the Whitney, this bell has been repurposed, reclaimed. As visitors move through the different parts of the plantation, they're invited to ring the bell in honor of all the people who lived here and died in the struggle for freedom. I pulled on the rope. The bell's metal tongue swung inside its body and its chime reverberated like a heavy heart. Right, so now I would like to once again invite discussion. Uh, what did you think was interesting or troubling about what I presented? Um, what thoughts do you have? What questions do you have? Um, I'll leave it there and see who would like to contribute something to this discussion. And again, once again, if you want to share something, you can click on reactions down at the bottom of your screen. From there, you can click raise hand and I will monitor the hands that go up and invite people in order to make a comment or ask a question. Glendoria. Wow, you said my name correctly, thank you. Oh. Um, first, I want to say amen to what you said about going to a plantation and visiting it. Um, it's, the education is just, it's so different. You don't know what is going to happen to you when you go there, but it is so powerful. And I, I haven't really, I, along with Carolyn, we both went to Monticello after reading Clint Smith's book. Um, and we didn't know what we didn't know, and we didn't know the reaction that we would have. Um, it sparked so much conversation. So I wanna say amen to that. But um, for you, I really would like to hear about how you came to have such empathy um, for enslaved people, for the history, 
Is there an origins to this for you? Um, did you have a friend who enlightened you? Was it a book? Can you tell us about that? Because I'm, I'm always so glad to see someone willing to educate us about these things. Thanks for that. That's, well, I appreciate your comment um, before the question. And I think we're definitely on the same page, so to speak, in terms of the power of those spaces. Um, I don't know exactly what the origin of this interest or empathy might be. I've been teaching US history for um, some, you know, as I said, um, more than 15 years. Um, and I think uh, a curiosity probably about the past um, grew into um, indignation and um, empathy that, you know, I, I feel like the more you learn, the more that you're willing to learn um, with an open heart and an open mind, um, there's something, there's some profound truths there about injustice and um, violence and also resistance. Um, and so I think the more I learned, the more I was able to develop that capacity, um, which I think is something that can happen for all of us, I don't think there's anything special about me in that regard. And in, in my study of migration, um, immigrant rights and justice and injustice in that, which is another one of my areas of writing and research, and in other areas, you know, um, it's kind of like a muscle, the more you're involved in campaigns for <laughs> social justice, uh, and the more you're interested in learning about it, the more you maybe develop a capacity for um, for that kind of thing. So I know that's not a specific moment or person, but I think it, it's been a process. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Who else would like to share a comment, question? Debbie, go ahead. Hi, Carl. Thanks for inviting us all to this talk. Yeah, this is this is a, sort of a I'm w wondering philosophically about the power of space like this because you know I've I've had similar experiences. Um, I did grow up in the South and and have visited plantations and found it very emotional and and I. I had a similar reaction when I visited Auschwitz. And, and I, think, I think what's fascinating is that the power of the place, even when it's uninhabited, there's something that's really hard to explain about that. You know, what, how, how does that work? How does that happen? Um, because you know you can read about something and you can hear about something and you can see a movie or a video, but there's something about being in the place that makes something incredibly real, even in the absence of the people who who lived or suffered there. Um, I think that's I, I think that's one of the. I think when people don't understand the value of history and the value of travel, those two things together. Um, I, I think one without the other gives you a, a less um, impactful, I guess, experience, um, which is in some ways beside the point of what you're talking about. But, uh, but I do think it's interesting and I, and I do think it's important for us to always encourage our students. I'm a, a I'm an educator like uh, Carl. I think it is so important for students to have those firsthand experiences because they do make a huge difference. Absolutely. Um, thank you, uh, Provost Preston, for that. And um, just so people can know um, that you, you took time to join us today, and we really appreciate that. But um, yeah, Debbie, when I first announced that I was going to be doing this talk, she wrote back and, you know, because she's very familiar with this site and has friends and colleagues who've done a lot of research on it. And so she was excited. 
and it's good to know more about you know your interest in that i think mm -hmm. you're saying something pretty deep there about um space and how those ghosts of the past um live on and some historians have done some pretty amazing work in terms of thinking about how can we locate those people who've been silenced and disappeared because of their lack of power and sometimes they even theorize it as you know finding ways to identify the ghosts of the past in the present because you know um james baldwin said the past is never past you know it or was that faulkner so i mean baldwin said something like that but um um so definitely definitely um yeah thanks debbie zania Zania, are you there? Yes. Hi. Um, I just wanted to speak about the 1811 German Coast Uprising. I think that it really relates to what we were speaking about in class. And I think like a common idea or thought that we are all keep on bringing up in the classroom is the fact that there's a lot of things about African-American history that we did not learn in school. And this is definitely one of them because I had no idea that this had taken place. And I think it also relates to what we were talking about um, when we were speaking about the American Revolution and how African-Americans would rather have risked their lives in war fighting for the British if that just meant the slightest chance that they would get their freedom. So I think that this was really interesting that in this uprising, they knew that if they were unsuccessful, that they were not gonna live. So I just think that's pretty interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for making some connections with what we're talking about in our in our class. That's always makes a person feel so happy. But no, I think you're absolutely right. And I'll just add as well that not only I'll share it for people who aren't in our class, um, not only do we observe what we don't learn or what we don't know about African American history, but we've talked also about the local history of slavery in New Jersey and how there were there was a slave revolt in Somerville. You know what I mean? Like we could you don't have to go very far from our campus to find a graveyard where enslaved people are buried. So these ghosts of the past are not just deep down in Louisiana. You know, um, slavery existed in every colony uh, in British North America. Um, and it lasted a long time well into the independence period in New Jersey. So um, just wanted to sort of piggyback on what Zania said there. Um, Kim. Thank you, Carl, for having this um, presentation tonight. I invited students from my um, class this evening because we had just gotten done, not done, but began teaching and talking about um, cultural relevancy in the classrooms of today in our modern time. And I was not expecting to, um, I, I've never visited the Whitney Plantation. I've not read about it. So this was all fresh and new for me. And I just wasn't um, expecting the, absolute beauty of having the souls of the children represented by those um, sculptures, but also just of the, the field of angels. And knowing that these children in that last generation that were able to then speak about what it was like for them is a perspective I've never even been told about um, in the history books or in my history classes. So for those of us who are teaching or in early childhood, um, this is new. It's something new to consider that not only are we teaching generations after generations of people who have been through um, life-changing events in their genealogy, but they're able to actually bring this alive through this. And I just really am grateful that we tuned in and that we can talk about how, um, you know, this leads us to what we do in our classrooms today and how we process what's happening you know, in our current generations and in their lives. So I just am moved. I'm so grateful. I'm definitely, definitely interested in visiting there if I ever get the chance. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Kim. Um, yeah, I'll just add that um, in, in terms of, I'm not in, in education. I mean, I'm I'm a, a teacher, but I'm not in that, the field of education. And, um, but from my perspective, uh, early childhood education happens as a parent, you know, like I've got a nine-year-old and a five-year-old and 
we talk about the past. I showed them my pictures. My five-year-old in particular was very struck by the kids and he identified with them. And so we had, it was an opportunity to talk about, you know, children actually were enslaved and let's, let's explore what that means. Um, and there's tons of good resources that I shared the 1619 Project expanded book, but they, they published at the same time um, a book called Born on the Water. And it's a children's book that um, also tells the story of um, the transatlantic slave trade, but also the making of African Americans uh, and, the, and the first child, the first African American who was born on the water and the first one to be born here. So it's, a, it's also about the creation of a new people. Um, so um, I know that kind of went far afield from what you said, Kim. I just wanted to add in. The, no, thank you. That. That's a great resource. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Chris, go ahead. Oh, you're muted still, Chris. I just wanted to say that I found the whole presentation very powerful and thank you very much for it. And nobody has commented on the, other than you, on the heads that were on the stakes. And I found that extremely powerful. I just can't even tell you how I felt about seeing that. It just, it's mind blowing that. Yeah, it just made it real, very real, I guess, is what I want to say. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I'll, I'll add a detail that um, I didn't really go into, but they've, they've done all the research, you know, they know exactly who was involved, who were the leaders, they have most of the names, it, a lot of it comes from the trials that followed after the suppression. And so, you know, like the memorial that documents the names of the 107,000 plus people who were enslaved in Louisiana, it, that the historians went and <laughs> located their names. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a refusal to let that act of resistance or the re act of resistance, which is just surviving slavery for however long you can, like it's a refusal to let them be erased from the past. And I just, think the work of historians in terms of creating memorials like that and, and doing the really painstaking work of documenting names and people is, is really revolutionary. Um, so, so thanks, Chris. Mark, go ahead. Oh, I had two things. Hmm? I had two things that were really like uh, profound to me. The first thing was how much they would like belittle slaves there was a lot of talk about how they would call them pigs and like the heads thing. It really like just shook me how they would like put that right in front of the homes of their slaves. And what's it called? Another thing I wanted to ask was what's it called? If they knew the exact number of slaves that were, that were uh, killed because of the revolt. They do. I don't know if I have that. Um number right here but they have it documented if um if anyone wants to reach out to me afterwards i can send you links and more information um and to your first point yeah i mean we talked about the idea of social death and the process of dehumanization um enslaved people part of the the dehumanization of slavery is about you know, again, we talked about turning human beings into commodities to be bought and sold for profit and to help make other commodities. But, um, you know, that's, that's also why anti-Black racism has such a long and persistent life, because it, it comes from the process of dehumanization, which was done on a, on a, a racial basis. And so, yeah, you're right. It's, awful the way that they equated them to animals and treated them as such. Uh, and it was part of the ideological underpinning of what it, it is to enslave another person. Um, so thanks, Mark, for that. Patrick, go ahead. Well, Carl, I'd just like to thank you so much for your presentation tonight. And um, I just want to get back to a comment that Glendoria made before about visiting Monticello. You know, I visited a number of plantations and recently visited Monticello and I've been there twice. 
and the visits were separated by 50 years. Mm. And what you really realize is how history is told differently over time. And I can tell you that my first visit to Monticello did not include the kind of history that was told that on my visit 50 years later. And I think it's just so important that we realize that the work of historians, and I just compliment, you know, Raritan Valley Community College and the library for, for putting this presentation on, because we, we do live in a time where history is again trying to be rewritten, where it is again trying to be subverted. And, you know, I just reflected on the, on the energy that went in to put in all that art and all that work to tell that story. And I just, I just fear for where we're at as a society and a culture where we're, we're not bringing these truths to light. And um, so I just encourage you in your work and uh, thank you for putting on your presentation tonight. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I agree that there's some scary things going on, some troubling things, especially with related to the past and, um, what people want to be shared or not be shared, but um, I get a lot of um, hope from conversations like this. You know, um, it's a public, we're a public college. This is a public library. We're coming together. Most of us don't know each other. We're having we're, these important conversations. Um, and again, just getting back to the, the, you know, there being spaces like this that people can visit and really have a transformative experience. Another one you, you might know about um, is uh, sponsored by the Equal Justice Initiative and Brian Stevenson, um, who is the author of the book Just Mercy and also the film you might have seen. But um, after a long period of time, they, um, they have that um, in Alabama, that um, memorial to the victims of racial violence and lynching. And it's, it's a, I haven't been there but I understand that it's a similar place that's, um, you know, changes you and sort of going to that space and thinking about our history of racial violence that still has major implications for today. Um, I'm, I get a lot of hope and encouragement from the fact that there are these spaces and I hope we can create more because it's part of our effort to um, reconcile with each other and with the past maybe. We're, looks like it's um, we're maybe getting close to wrapping up time, um, but let's see if anyone else has a comment or a question that they want to share before we all go our separate ways for the evening. Anyone else who's holding on to that insight question comment that you want to share before we sign off? Glendoria. I will say that for the people that are on the Zoom um, session, you know, after my trip to Monticello, I've been talking, speaking to my parents and uncles and aunts about their experiences. Um, my family, you know, they were from the South, so they migrated to the North. And I'm learning about things that I would not have had it not been for Clint Smith's book, um, because they were a part of the sharecropping um, um, part of our history. And it's not far from slavery. And, it's, and they did many of the things that the slaves did. And I think it was Debbie who's from the South, but there will be things that you can learn from aunts and uncles, any, any of the elders about what life was like on both sides. So I would really encourage if you have family members who are older, listen, get your, get your questions ready and ask them the stories, uh, ask them to tell you the stories, because it's not that far from, you know, the end of slavery. It's not that far, you know, and some members will be able to really go back and tell you some things. Absolutely. I think that's great advice and I definitely agree with that. Thank you for that. All right, well, um, thank you everyone for joining this for all your comments and, um, and questions. And thanks again, Jane, for hosting this. I hope everyone has a good night and um, 
you can find me on the RVCC um, website if within my email information. Actually, you know what? I'll put it in my in the chat here. So um, if you want to contact me to keep the conversation going, you can do that. Carl. Yes. Um, I before you say good, good night to everyone, I uh -huh. would also like to thank you for being here tonight. Uh, for all of you who came and took some time out of your schedules. Um, I just have to say, I was walking with you through that place. Hmm. I felt the heaviness that you were talking about. I was overcome many times by the images that I saw. I was shocked and sobered by everything. Um, I was really impressed by the genealogical work that was done that could restore some dignity in death to those people who had no dignity in life. And it was a labor of love for those people to do one name after another, find the dates. Uh, it, was, it was very powerful for me. Um, so I thank you for these insights and for taking us on this journey. Uh, on a side note, I, uh, there are a couple questions about whether the recording will be made available. Uh, as soon as I get the technology piece of this straightened out, I will send out an email to everybody with information on how to access the recording. My name is Jane Ricketts and just look for an email from me. And finally, as we are closing this, if we were in a public space in our meeting room in the library, I would ask everybody as we were leaving to exit the room in silence uh, as a tribute to those people whose stories that will never be told completely. And I wish that we had that bell tolling, the one that you referenced at the end of your talk, because I can imagine how powerful that would be. So on that note, I'd like to thank you all, especially Dr. Linz Koog and everybody else for being here this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.